as the um, current president of the Friends of Lanthier Memorial Library, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, this evening to our first of the season um, Tuesday talk series. Uh, we have um, three talks typically scheduled in the spring and three talks um, scheduled in the autumn, figuring that people are too busy doing wonderful things in the summer to take advantage of some of these programs. So anyways, I'd like to welcome everyone and look out for next month's um, program with Garrett, um, who will be talking, Garrett Buglian, who will be talking about um, cults and cult theory and cult thoughts. But meanwhile, tonight we have Teresa, and I will pass it over to Jenna to introduce um, Teresa Snow from Salvation. Welcome, everyone. Well, I'd like to say how pleased I am that Teresa is with us this evening. I heard her speak a couple of years ago in Stowe and was very impressed by her presentation and by the organization. Uh, Salvation Farms is, I guess you're headquartered in Morrisville, right here. Um, so I was very pleased that you were able to join us tonight and uh, looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Well, thank you for, for the invitation and for having me. Um, I'm going to try to transition to my presentation uh, as smoothly as possible. So um, thanks again for having me and for all of you that made time this evening to to uh, join the conversation and to learn about the work, um, vision, philosophy of Salvation Farms. As I've been introduced, my name is Teresa Snow, uh, and I am the founder and executive director of Salvation Farms. We're a nonprofit organization. We're based here in Morrisville, Vermont, and our work has uh, local, uh, statewide, and national reach. And our work aims to engage local people with local farms in a way that will lead Vermont towards eating more of what its farms produce. Now, if you already know of Salvation Farms, it might be because of our gleaning work. Uh, that is how Salvation Farms got its start. We started that work right here in the Lamoille Valley where Morseville um, is centered. But what Salvation Farms does and strives to influence goes way beyond gleaning, but let's start there. Um, gleaning is the act of reaping after the harvest. The folks pictured here, they're gleaners, and they're picking spinach uh, that the farmer wasn't going, uh, going to sell. I'm curious if anyone wants to um, speak up uh, and share with me, why do you think this farmer wasn't going to uh, pick this spinach? I'm guessing it's not commercially viable for him for some reason. Mm -hmm. Great guess. Anybody Diane, else have a thought? Yeah, you can, you all can unmute yourself, but Diane put in chat that okay. one of the reasons might be no staff. Okay, no. great guess. Well, it, those are both really fabulous guesses. Um, and the interesting thing about this, this scenario, um, this picture was taken on a Mother's Day. Uh, this spinach had been planted actually the previous fall and the farmer had allowed that planting to overwinter and that spinach started growing as soon as it could in the spring. And so that farm was able to pick um, very early the finest baby spinach off of this planting. It was a big field. Um, and this farmer was able to get it to market when nobody else was bringing spinach to the market. And they were able to cut, you know, baby spinach out of this field more than once. Because you, the way you pick it, you pick it by leaf and it grows again. You pick it by leaf, it grows again. And eventually it just gets big. So this spinach is actually a bit overgrown uh, and it's totally marketable, very edible. And the farmer actually could have sold this spinach, but he knew 
that all of his neighbor farmers were just coming into some of their first baby spinach. And he wanted to compete on par with his neighbor farmers. And you can see in the, feet, in the, in the row, in the woman with her purple jacket, um, that's his, this farm's next planting of spinach. And that's baby size spinach. And he realized I'm gonna go into that planting and I'm gonna make this planting available for gleaning. Um, because I don't want to glut the market um, and unnecessarily compete with my neighbor farmers. This morning, we left shortly after this picture was taken. We picked 660 pounds of spinach. And after we left, all the spinach that remained behind these folks was tilled into the soil. So before I talk more about Salvation Farm's mission and work, I wanna offer a little bit of context. Um, I encourage all of you to um, you know, hold your questions till the end. I may prompt you again, just like I did. Um, but uh, uh, I, think, I think the content that I'll provide will, will be good fodder for a conversation um, af after the presentation. So what this on your, on your screen shows, um, is that nationally, the United States wastes 63 million tons of edible food annually. You know, really what is 63 million tons of food? Well, that's enough edible food to fill the Rose Bowl every single day of the year. And we do that every year. What I find pretty amazing about this, this graph um, is if, I'm trying to think if you're looking at the right side or the left side, underneath where it says refed, <clears throat> it shows a little house. That represents our homes. 43% of all edible food waste happens in our homes. The next one over, 40% happens in places where we access food. Everything from supermarkets to restaurants to cafeterias. So an astounding 83% of all food wasted in this country is at locations where we interface with it, where we have power over that reality. A very small percent um, is uh, wasted in manufacturing or lost in manufacturing. And then a remaining 16% um, is lost on the farm. Salvation Farms mission does not really focus on the food waste that happens after it leaves, leaves the farm, what we call the farm gate. We focus on the edible food that remains on farms, and we consider that food loss versus food waste. So, you know, what is the difference between food loss and food waste? Food loss is when edible food goes unharvested or is harvested, but remains unsold um, or is not donated. And Food waste is edible food that ends up in the waste stream and eventually in the landfill. So why, why does food loss happen? Why does edible food stay on farms? And there's lots of reasons why food loss happens. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, there were two, um, two thoughts around why that spinach wasn't picked, but can anyone name any additional reasons why a farmer might not harvest edible crops? It or looks ugly. It couldn't look ugly. Um, <laughs> why might they pick it and then you know, not sell it? Hmm. Good question. I, I don't know if it's a matter of, they don't think they're gonna get enough money for it. Um, but then again, some money is better than no money, possibly, but I'm not a farmer, so I don't know if that rationale is, is backwards or not. <laughs> well, isn't, Teresa, in some cases, like with milk, that it costs too much to actually <laughs> distribute it then, and so that's why it gets spilled, or there's no one to get it to that can process it. I love, I love this. So everything that you all have mentioned now or in the previous slide with the spinach revolves around economics, really. Um, 
One thing that's important to note is that farmers always try to produce enough food to be to meet market demand and safeguard against the unexpected. You know, for example, weather and pests um, are good examples of the unexpected. Planting a little extra is like an insur insurance plan. So sometimes, um, you know, surplus on farms is just just that it, it's surplus, but most of it is is economical. Um, the product, it just might not be economical to harvest. You know, think if a, a farmer has competing harvests and, you know, they're, they're faced with the option of picking some head lettuce or hothouse tomatoes. They're going to go with the hothouse tomatoes, which means likely the lettuce may not get picked and sent to market. Um, farmers plant things in multiple plantings. Think um, green beans and broccoli and like that loose leaf spinach or, or salad mix. And they'll go through and they'll pick broccoli at its prime and they're gonna move on to their next planting when, it ha when they have prime heads of broccoli and they're gonna leave some in that last planting. The same with string beans. They're gonna pick it when, it's, when you've got a heavy flush. If any of you are gardeners, you know the first couple picks off green beans are great. And then the last three or four, you know, they're pretty sparse. So a farmer is gonna, always be producing when it's most efficient to pick. Um, often farmers are faced with unavailable or unaffordable labor issues, and that will leave stuff in the field. Some have capacity issues that they might not have enough storage capacity or even containers for the volume that they produce. And sometimes it's market saturation. Um, you know, a lot of um, a lot of folks are aware that um, there's some produce that also just doesn't look perfect and it doesn't fit the marketplace. Um, and so that will often also lead to surplus product. So Salvation Farms, we did a study here in Vermont trying to find out how much edible food was left on Vermont's produce farms. This was, this was the first statewide study in the nation. And we surveyed farmers asking for them to estimate how much edible food did they think they were leaving in the field and how much edible food did they harvest but not sell or donate. And we took um, those estimates and they were percents of, of, of guesses by our farmers and paired that with census data. And as a result, we, we found based on farmer input that upwards of 14.3 million pounds of edible vegetables and berries remain on our, state far, our state's farms each year. And the reason I say edible vegetables and berries is because no orchards responded to the survey. So if we considered our orchards and our uh, tree fruit, that number could be considerably higher. What I, what I find particularly astounding is that farmers predict of the 14.3 million pounds, only 32% is left unpicked in the field. You know, they're almost estimating 70% of this edible food is already picked. So what does 14.3 million pounds of produce look like? Well, that pallet of carrots, uh, that's about a thousand pounds. And a standard size pickup truck can fit about 2000 pounds of root crops. So if we were to put just 14.3 million pounds of root crops, potatoes and carrots, into pickup trucks, it would fill more than 7,000 pickup trucks. And if you lined them up end to end, they would extend more than 26 miles. Uh, that's the distance from the Waterbury exit to the Burlington exit. And I like to call it a marathon of nutrition. Um, and if, you know, if we aren't talking about root crops and we're talking about greens or berries, you know, it's likely to be a much longer line of pickup trucks. Now, one thing I like to put into perspective of that, 
you know, there is this food loss that's happening on farms. Meanwhile, our state institutions alone, like hospitals, schools, and prisons, they're spending upwards of $10 million a year to purchase fresh fruits and vegetables from outside Vermont. So Salvation Farms, we've really been, we've really been thinking about this for a while. You know, how can Vermont make better use of what its farms produce? We've um, engaged a lot of colleagues in different conversations. We've tried to think about, well, what kind of strategy can Vermont have to broadly manage the surplus its farms produce? Because kind of to your point, Jack, about milk, it's not just produce. There's proteins, there's animal meats, as well as fluid milk. We've done asset mapping, trying to figure out, well, what kind of infrastructure might be available? What are the opportunities for this surplus food, particularly if we could reduce what we're bringing in from out of state to feed ourselves? Um, and we've modeled different responses, you know, um, both to serve the charitable purpose, but also to look at how we can serve institutional needs, again, like schools, prisons, and hospitals. This image that's on your screen um, resulted from one from several of our efforts, but one in which we talked to some uh, colleagues, advisors to get some perspective from them of what they thought Vermont could do um, with farm surplus paired with what we knew could happen as well. You see in the top center, the farms. You know, farms can take this product and they can till it into their soil, they can add it to their compost, they can feed it to animals, um, they can feed it to themselves and their workers, they could even sell it to other animal farmers. Then they can also send it to donations, you know, to engage gleaning organizations, to have direct relationships with local food shelves um, or the Vermont Food Bank. They could make some of this food available to their local institutions. Some farms do give to their local schools where their children go to school. And there could be some meal prep or uh, prepared food sites. So like our Meals on Wheels programs and our senior, our senior meal sites. And then another avenue is market development. Um, this product could serve restaurants. They don't need perfect looking food. It could go into farm stands. Consumers, when they have a relationship with a farm, they tend to uh, be willing to try new and different looking things. So farm stands, uh, farmers markets, uh, CSA shares, um, that's where we can start to move some of this other food to consumers. There's also opportunities for sales to institutions, um, also processing. How do we take this food that might be blemished or not look perfect um, and turn it into something that hides those imperfections? It makes it easier for someone, whether it's a, a person at home or a, a, a school food service worker to use this food. So the next couple of slides, um, I'm gonna tell you a kind of basically a story of uh, some of the things Salvation Farms has done, um, hopefully helping make more visible some of the opportunities uh, that, that we think could have both short-term and long-term impact uh, in our state's food system by putting to use Vermont's surplus farm produce. So when produce is left on farms, some of it is eaten by the farmers, their families and their employees. But often a large amount of this food is tilled into the soil. Some is added to the compost pile. and some will be fed to animals. And these are all good resourceful uses for a farm. The, as I like to say, the unharvested or unsold food becomes an input and serves to become food again. You know, farmers are not wasteful. That's another reason why Salvation Farms does not call food left on farms as, as uh, food waste. Uh, farmers are incredibly resourceful and if this isn't serving its, its first purpose, which is to support their business, 
uh, by sending it to market, they'll find another way in which this food can also serve their business. However, Vermont's surplus farm produce could also feed our communities. And we're gonna look at where and when surplus crops might exist and what could be done with it to help us feed ourselves. And we're gonna do this by following a carrot uh, from the field. You can see the field behind the, the two women outside. That is all carrots uh, that a farm is growing uh, to put into storage. And then you can see the other two women on the right standing in front of these massive wooden bins that are full of carrots and other root crops. Um, those have been of course, grown in the growing season and now they're being stored uh, through the winter for washing and sorting and selling. Um, and even into the winter or into the spring and early summer months. Pretty amazing what some of our farms are doing um, with storage. And here's a farm crew and they're sorting through the harvested and winter stored, stored carrots, removing the carrots that won't meet market specifications. So basically they're packing for market and culling out you know, what won't make the grade. And those crops might look like this. You know, while we like to think of this food as naturally beautiful and edible, uh, they most often are not marketable. And then for carrots that don't make it out of the field, if the farmer hasn't picked it, they might invite the farmers to enter the field to harvest what the farm can't afford to or what they don't have the capacity to store um, or what they don't have a market for. And when pro surplus produce exists, uh, it can be for many reasons at varying volumes, like in large bins like this one, full of twisted, broken, oversized carrots, or in smaller volumes. These volumes are often best collected with the help of volunteers um, and distributed to community-based charitable food programs, like food shelves and senior meal sites. But the larger volumes most often need additional handling, washing, sorting, packing, um, some into larger packs and some into smaller packs. You know, Salvation Farms believes this washing and packing is a great opportunity for workforce development and job readiness training. I really wanna note um, that while well, all of these are Salvation Farms images, um, the one previous, this one, and the next two are images from our surplus crop food hub and our training program. Salvation Farms operated this food hub and training program between the years of 2016 um, and early 2020. Much of this work, we, we, we know farmers can't afford to, we know the private marketplace can't afford to, and we're trying to look at how do we, how do we add value into the system in a way that can handle this food, make it available to more people in more places, um, in a way that works in our economic system. And our answer was to incorporate workforce development. We can create more positive impact by doing it this way. And our training program includes certifications. Our trainees receive first aid CPR training, serve safe training, OSHA training. They um, learn transferable hard skills like um, oh, shipping and receiving, um, assigning a lot system so that they can uh, trace a product as it comes in the door all the way through cleaning and packing and back out. Um, they learned how to work as a team, how to uh, quality assess product, uh, how to take a raw product and create an end product. Many of these individuals learned how to use a pallet jack and that was a huge moment for many of our trainees. This training program also involved guest presenters, uh, folks who would teach them about compost, um, talk to them about um, financial literacy, um, talk to them uh, 
about working with farmers and, and helping farmers find uh, market outlets. They were exposed to documentaries about the food system, about hunger, about um, food waste, about uh, obesity uh, and malnutrition. And we went on several field trips with our trainees to show them that what they were learning in this facility could transfer to a variety of um, employment opportunities from working in a produce department to working in a de deli or cafe to working in a shipping receiving area um, uh, to uh, um, working in uh, even food manufacturing. And so we really wanted to bolster their skill set um, so that they could see the array of opportunities available to them. We also supported them in job searching. And one of the strongest elements for these individuals were the moments when volunteers would come and work with them because they had their own rapport with their fellow trainees. When there were new people in the space, they got to teach others what they had learned and modeled um, the expectations that they held for each other for these new, these, these new volunteers supporting them. It was a really powerful part of this program. So in handling of surplus produce at scale, um, coupled with job training, unmarketable produce is sorted and made ready for packing. It's, it is important, as I've already said, that this work is not profitable for farmers to do. You can see the carrots there that are all hairy and they're starting to sprout and they're even a little slimy. Those were donated to us, I think in March or April. Of course, pick the previous fall and the resulting carrots are clean, trimmed and ready to go out to people. Farmers can't do this. They just can't afford. It's easier to compost them or to feed it to animals. But through this process, some crops are identified as not suitable for distribution in their whole raw form. So in that big bag or in those little bags. Um, and then, you know, these crops, they are set aside for minimal processing. <clears throat> in this case, they were made into a frozen product. So what Salvation Farms has tried to do is figure out what in our food system needs to be developed so that we're making use of this food that currently doesn't have a use or doesn't have an outlet. And we've taken a food product that would have gone into the compost pile. We have cleaned it and packed it. And we're gonna distribute that to some outlets. And even the product that is basically cold twice, it wasn't even good enough to go out in that package, we're gonna make into a frozen product. So we basically saved it twice. And for the crops that don't make the cut, for either raw packing or minimal processing, they're sent off to be compost or turned into animal feed. <clears throat> so Salvation Farm's mission, I haven't told you that because I think that if I had told you in the beginning, it might not have made much sense. Um, our mission is to build resilience in Vermont's food system through managing agricultural surplus. Basically, how do we help Vermont feed itself more locally by using what it produces? We have goals to reduce food loss on farms, increase the use of locally grown foods, and build greater appreciation for Vermont's agricultural past and future. It's really that last bullet. Well, the other two are so important. How can we build appreciation is, uh, for the agricultural past and future of our state? And our population is by engaging people in the work. We are firmly rooted in ideals of sustainable agriculture, resource management, and experiential education. We do think that farms are our salvation. Eating is such an essential thing. And I hope that every one of you do it every single day, right? It's something that is so crucial to every single one of our lives. The experiential education component of Salvation Farms work, the engaging people in our work, we believe that people have the power to create change. And in order to reduce 
our overall vulnerability, not just those that are in need today, but all of us that depend on systems that are outside of our control, we need to become intimately familiar with systems that support our essential needs. So by engaging people in our work, whether they're volunteers or trainees, or whether they're people that receive the food that we might donate to locations, they're learning about what Vermont farms grow and they're learning about when that food is available seasonally. So that if for some reason trucks don't drive into Vermont to stock the shelves of Hannaford's or Shaw's, we're all gonna feel a little bit more familiar and comfortable using what our farms produce. So I wanna thank you again for this opportunity. Uh, to share Salvation Farm's work and our vision with you. There's a lot more that um, I could certainly share, but I think that's a pretty solid foundation for some context of our work, why we do it, <clears throat> what we've tried to do, and what we are doing. Um, so I'd be more than happy to answer any questions uh, that any of you have. And there's my contact information. How many tons of carrots do you move? Carol, I don't have the microphone. Well, um, I'm wondering first, Jack, when I should stop sharing my screen, if I should keep it up. You can go ahead and, um, and, uh, and stop sharing it now, and then we can go to gallery view, if that's OK. Great. All right. That's great. Um, so how many tons? I'm going to remove the spotlight. There we go. Yay. How many tons of carrots? Well, this last year, we moved 5.5 tons. I've got my grid right here. Um, we've done more of carrots in the past. Um, but in total last year, we moved um, oh, <clears throat> roughly 70,000 70, pounds of produce. Um, that would, do, would be over 200,000 servings. Yeah. Um, Beth uh, Springsteen asks, what areas of Vermont do you work in? Do you limit yourself to Lamoille County? Right, so we've worked, we've worked all over the state um, through different partnerships. Um, we've worked in uh, Rutland County um, we have worked in Windsor County, in Wyndham County. Um, our primary uh, base for our gleaning program is Lamoille Valley. Um, we've worked in Chittenden County. Um, we have advised programs from Grand Isle Franklin to Washington County, um, to Addison County and Rutland. So I think it really depends on the, the partners that we have. Um, our food hub was based in Winooski, uh, so that, that operation with our training program um, was in Chittenden County. But a lot of the food we handled from that, that space went you know, across Vermont, and some of it even left Vermont. Uh, it's amazing with this amount of food sitting on farms. Um, there's a very small amount that's actually being captured, um, about 5% by all of the programs out there doing this work between Salvation Farms, the six other members of the Vermont Gleaning Collective, the Vermont Food Bank. And still we can't, we can't move it because we're trying to move all of this food in its fresh form in season when it's, you know, when when there's already such, such a volume of fresh food. So some of the product that we moved through Winooski, some of it went as far as West Virginia. <laughs> wow. um, yeah, we do provide technical assistance to other organizations. So right now we're working with an organization mm -hmm. in Rhode Island and another one in, in Colorado, um, helping them look at their, um, their business models, 
their, their organizational systems, um, how they work with farms, how do they keep data. Also been advising most recently another uh, program in New Jersey. Um, but, you know, I think it, it's, it's hard to point to where our programming serves. We really strive to serve Vermont broadly um, by modeling opportunities that could be replicated anywhere in the state. Um, you know, we worked for a while in one of our state's prisons in Windsor. Um, the state has seven, six prisons now, um, so that programming could happen in multiple locations. Um, we are looking at some new partnerships, primarily in the Northeast region of Vermont to do some of this work to help us make some frozen product, um, as well as to create a new, another new gleaning program in the state. We'll provide them three years of technical assistance. So. Teresa, I have a question for you. Um, is there any uh, public interface where like someone like me who might want to not necessarily have a CSA, but um, decide that I want to go pick some, let some spinach before it gets turned under. And is there any kind of a program where you could pick some and give some so like you could pick some for yourself and pick a bag for yourself, pick a bag for the food shelf for the food pantry or whatever program, you know, is there, is there any kind of situation like that where I would think that that would be kind of fun, you know? Yeah. You know, I think um, Salvation Farms works to try to um, be an operational complement to farms. So what we want to do is provide a service, a professional service to farms. And so um, what, and I'll get, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story and answer your question more directly, but um, what has led us down the path of serving more charitable food sites, so food shelves and meal programs, is because we don't want to compete with farms in the marketplace. So when we go to farms and, and collect what they're not selling, we have to be really, we have to have a degree of discernment about where we're going to send that food. We don't take free food and give it to schools because those schools have dollars where they can invest in farms. Um, however, as it relates to volunteers who come out and glean with us, um, we like to say first um, that you're coming to one, help us serve this farm, help this farm feed its community in a way that it can't afford to. And we pick for the community first and often there's extra and we encourage volunteers to take a little bit home. But it's often not the thing that we say, come and get food for yourself and help us pick for others. Because we wanna be really mindful of um, you know, what that might mean for the farmer. Um, particularly if our volunteers are able to support the farm financially. So, does that make sense? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, it'd be very interesting for a farmer, let's say if they, if they had, I mean, it's a lot to organize volunteers, so they wouldn't want that kind of a program. As far as I was thinking, maybe if they wanted to invite folks out to help them harvest um, in, in trade. And I wonder if that's more of like the, like the you pick situation specifically. Right. Yeah. Uh, Teresa, I had a que uh, two questions. One is, how does you, how does your organization as a nonprofit sustain itself? And second, for those of us who would like to be allies of your work, how do we support you? Yeah. Oh, it's a good question. Tell all of your friends about us. Um, we, you know, it's really important that people know that Salvation Farms exists that we do important programming that serves this community um, uh, in ways that have daily impact in people's lives and ways that have long-term impact in Vermont. Um, but even outside that, we're really trying to influence the food system in Vermont so that we all can be eating locally grown foods, whether we want to or not. Um, so I think one talking about us is really important. Um, volunteering is also another great way to get involved. So you can visit our website and financially supporting us is another great way to, um, to be involved with Salvation Farms work. 
um, donations of any size um, are great. It, 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 we just love to have people join our work in whatever way works for them. Um, so we are a nonprofit, so we do fundraise. Um, as the founder, I often forget that that's part of my job because I do this because I love this work. Um, but fundraising is a really important piece to sustaining this organization. Uh, we have individual and business donors, so like yourselves and like the companies you've worked for or work for or own. Um, uh, we do some special events. Um, sometimes businesses will do businesses will do cause related marketing things for us, um, like a Moco, for example, might do their roundup for us. Um, Rock our brewery did a beer for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, um, we do a lot of grant writing, a lot of grant writing, um, about. 60 to 65% of, of uh, our income is from grants. And that's not just one grant. Um, we can have anywhere from 12 to 24 grants in a year. Um, we have received very little state, in, or we've received very little state funding and re have received to date no federal dollars. Um, just this last year, we approached, actually just this year, we approached some of Lamoil Valley towns to see um, about um, taxpayer support. And that was approved in some of uh, Lamoil Valley towns. So that's really exciting to, to be on town budgets. Um, we do generate a little bit of revenue. Um, some of the product that we move, we actually buy from farmers and we actually sell it so we can generate some income. Uh, that's primarily sold to the Department of Corrections for use in the, the prison meal programs. We also earn revenue by providing technical assistance to organizations um, and other co contract related work um, generate income, but, but primarily through grants, individual donors and business donors, primary revenue. Teresa, you, you mentioned there, even with your wonderful work, which it seems if I understood you correctly, that comprises maybe only 5% of the food utilized that would otherwise go to waste. Is there any other, it just seems to me like there, 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 there should be something else out there to be able to reclaim more than just 5% considering you're saying that there's like however many tons of food that are just left in the fields, if even the farmers aren't using. So how do you capture more? A really great question. And that's like, that's the, um, that is the question, I think. Um, and, and, you know, w there's a couple different things that Salvation Farms would like to do in addition to continuing our programming, which shows the, uh, this opportunity, it, it makes visible that this reality exists out there. Um, we want to do a more in-depth study to find out really how much food is staying on farms, for what reason, and what is its condition, and is it in the field or is it after harvest? Um, and is there a way for farmers to track that and notify folks um, in a timely manner that it's part of their operation to do so? Um, can we start to understand so that we're starting to predict what crops at what volumes are available in what regions of Vermont. Once we know more of that, we can start to say, okay, we produce 20 tons of extra sweet corn between the middle of August to the beginning of September in Bennington County. We know we need that in the Northeast Kingdom. Right now, we don't have that kind of planning or communication to actually move that product. We also don't have the infrastructure to say, well, how do we make that corn into creamed corn, right? Because all of a sudden, if we can make it into creamed corn or even dehydrated corn, I'm not sure if people dehydrate corn except for popcorn, but if we were to make it into a product that had some shelf stability, then all of a sudden we don't need to move it to the Northeast Kingdom. We can store it. 
and it can be used by institutions like hospitals and schools um, that are used to using foods that are pre-prepared and shelf stable. So essentially what the issue is, is that we don't have, we don't have the, excuse my language, the industry language, we don't have the supply chain to make good use of this food. And therefore we're trying to move it fresh. And, and just like, you know, there's only so much zucchini Vermont can eat. Um, <laughs> So just think of that, like when you can't, when the farmer can't, in your garden, you can't sell this zucchini anymore. You try to give it to the food shelves. Well, they don't want any more. So, well, then what do we do with the zucchini? Um, and that's where you know, there, there needs to be supports. And, and we have tried to create um, private, um, private sector, public sector, nonprofit sector partnerships so that we could have basically kind of subsidized operations that could um, support through job training, or maybe it's a, a, a corrections, you know, like the Department of Corrections, maybe it's a corrections-based program where we could offer valuable working and learning opportunities while um, handling this food that the private sector can't afford to do by itself. And so, and so, identifying what the real volume is of these types of crops and when they're available will then help us also justify, well, what kind of infrastructure do we need? Um, is it enough volume in Vermont that we produce in winter squash that um, can't go to market because it has a ding on it to justify a canning line to make pureed winter squash? Um, do we produce enough soft onions in Vermont to uh, and zucchini to create a dehydration facility to to hold to make this food shelf stable. Um, so I, that that's that's a you know it's a complicated answer that's really focused on thinking innovatively, thinking um, generationally, and and taking some risk on investment. Um, So Teresa, how did you get to be where you are today? <laughs> how did you get to be able to be the founder of Salvation Farms? What what got you from point A to point B? <laughs> right now it's a Toyota pickup truck. Um, but actually it was then too. Uh, so uh, it's interesting. Um, I was talking with uh, our new employee earlier today about my personal story and um, uh, and what led me into this work. Um, it it you know I've always agriculture has always been a part of my life. Um, you know, I remember my my grand my grandparents had a dairy farm. My parents were small scale home, small scale homesteaders when I was very little. So I, my first memories are really connected to the garden and the in our dairy farm. And um, then I like to say that I was a teenager <laughs> and uh, yeah. there was a part of me as a teenager that was a little, uh, I challenged things, I questioned things, which sometimes as a teenager isn't always healthy, but it is healthy to, to question things. And I think that questioning mind um, actually helped lead me to this, to this work. Um, but really it was my time at Sterling College. Um, I studied agriculture and natural resource management at Sterling College in Craftsbury, Vermont, um, and learned a lot about basic, basic needs and life skills. Um, also about um, things like uh, the, the exploitation of populations and natural resources. Um, I became pretty passionate about um, fighting genetic engineering. Um, and the work that that was doing to control some of our food supply and our source. Um, and I thought that I was probably just gonna work for a farm and have a, my own little homestead, uh, but I ended up um, enrolling in an AmeriCorps program that I would go into when I finished college. Um, and then I was after that probably gonna farm and homestead. But 
um, this AmeriCorps experience happened, the timing was pretty impeccable. I think probably most of you know that life just kind of rolls out in front of you um, and gives you opportunities that challenge you to learn and grow. Um, so this AmeriCorps program, um, ultimately, I was responsible for a, a team of my peers between 18 and 24 years of age. Um, and we did service projects. And our very first service project was uh, assigned to do disaster relief after the collapse of the World Trade Towers in New York City. Hmm. And I wasn't there immediately after um, September 11th, but I was there about six weeks after. And um, I lived in a hotel in, in Times Square and I'd walk to me, this massive building on the Hudson River um, where there were dozens of different social service organizations. And every day I'd go to this family assistance center uh, for the Red Cross and I would try to see if there were services that the Red Cross could provide people that were seeking support. Um, and I worked directly with people who lost their jobs, who lost their homes, and also people who lost family members uh, on that day. Um, and what really hit me working with these individuals, of course, being in downtown Manhattan, very far from Morseville, Vermont in Lamoille County, um, and Sterling College for that matter, um, it struck me that that the people that were coming to ask me to help them had put all of their eggs um, you know, in a basket that, that really was dependent on commerce and a, and a, and a monetary economy. That, that, that these individuals had no home or land-based economy to fall back on to meet some of their most essential needs. And coming again out of Sterling, where I learned I, I learned how to you know camp in the winter and and how to brain tan a hide and do fire by friction and some basic survival skills, but also being from Vermont and knowing that we have you know we can grow our own food and there's wild edibles in our backyards and um, that the earth produces medicine as well, you know. It was really hard and uh, I didn't leave that experience knowing that I was going to set out to try to change the world. Um, it, it just kind of hit me um, and I really struggled for a number of years that I felt the culture was on a bit of a perilous path, um, that people were really distracted from what was really important. Um, you know, company is important, companionship, but really, what, what do we need? We need, to, we need food, we need water, and we need to stay warm or cold. Um, and I think people have really lost touch with that. And I was really struggling with how separate people were from the earth and the food system and farms. And I still didn't know at that point that I was gonna do something about it. I was working for Pete's Greens and Pete saw that I was having a relatively hard time and, uh, and he said, what the heck do you want to do? He wanted me to keep working for him, but he knew that I was struggling. And I said, I, I want to teach people about farms. I want to teach them about food. I, I want to help my community feel like they have some agency over something as basic and essential as meeting their need to eat. And he said, well, I have some extra greens. <laughs> Can you do anything with them? And uh, Ironically, while I was at AmeriCorps, I was also exposed to this idea of gleaning. And I said, maybe. I said, I bet I could engage the community to help me pick what you're not gonna sell. And I can teach those people about farms and local food. And then we can move this food into the community to feed people that, you know, that aren't buying your food. And then we can teach them about your farm and the food you're growing. And he said, okay. And then it's just kind of, un it just has unfolded from there, you know. Um, and, and, and I, 
I think they have a degree of persistence as well as that um, questioning, uh, as well as a bit of a, I'm a hopeless optimist. Um, you know, some days I'm not as positive as others. I just see tremendous opportunity. And I think that the opportunity doesn't come from one organization doing everything. Um, it really comes from through partnerships and collaborations. And what I like to say is leveraging who has the skill, who has the knowledge, who has the resource, and let's fold it in to the project with this other skill, this other resource, this other knowledge, so that we become stronger together. That's my story. Thank you. It was awesome. Great <laughs> story. That was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, support you. people follow their instincts and paths to create what you have. <laughs> Well, I, I, th I thank you. And it's moments like these where it, it feel, it's validated. Um, some days it feels hard. Um, and I do think that there's been a lot of fuel on the fire you know, and that drive to want to make change. And, and I've had, you know, I've countless people prop me up, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. team members of which three are here tonight um, board members, my family, yeah, right? Um, donors, you know, farmers, you know, this like Salvation Farms is really, it's, it's, it, it's, it's something that is, yes, it's something I started, but it's something that's so much more. And, uh, and, I, and I think that's where its real power comes from. Good. How many farms do you actually work with in Lamoille County? Like how many number wise are part of your, your team, in other words? Yeah, so this last year we worked with 20 farms and, and say probably it's always around a dozen, give or take. Um, and some of those farms, you know, like Pete's Greens, it's where we started, you know, they're a big farm. Um, now we work with them year round. We're there almost every single week of the year. And then there's, um, you know, Rusty Bird Farm, which is a small farm that maybe will call us once a year and say, hey, I've got this extra stuff. Can you come and get it? Uh, so, so we work with farms of all different sizes and at all different frequencies and in different scenarios. Some we, we just pick up what they've already harvested and some we go into the field. Mm -hmm. Um, we do work with, well, we actually created the statewide network of gleaning organizations, um, uh, of which there's now seven members. They represent um, seven different regions in the state, which is quite exciting. Um, and uh, they work as a community of practice. Uh, and that network of gleaners, they're serving 100 and I've got my annual report right here. Um, but they're serving, yeah, 125, 126 farms, uh, at least they did last year. You know, so that really, that network itself um, creates such a reach um, for the service to farms um, and, and a collaboration. Many of those organizations work together. So we work with an organization that serves Washington County. We're gonna be working with an organization um, that is going to be serving the Northeast Kingdom. So uh, it really builds power across organizations. And the number of farms that um, we were working with through the Surplus Crop Food Hub um, would, would average between eight to 12 um, a year. Uh, there were certainly some bottlenecks in that program. There was only so much capacity we had to handle volume. And only some, you know, a certain degree of farms that had the kind of volume that we would need um, for that operational system. Uh, and then brokering, when we buy surplus from farms and, and sell it, we're working with a very few right now. Um, I think we've worked with, I would guess, less, less than six, between probably four, four or five. Um, last year, it was, just, it was just two farms, but in the past we had had worked with some more. Cool. 
since you started in the city with your inspiration, <laughs> have you been able to draw any city folks to the country to kind of see what farms really are all about? <laughs> um, no, well, maybe. Um, I think we've engaged a lot of, a lot of diverse populations in our work, which has been a, a really amazing thing about Salvation Farms. We have brought a lot of um, young professionals into Vermont. We're a huge fan of AmeriCorps programming. So there's a VISTA program. We've brought many folks in to Vermont through hosting them and then they stay, which is exciting. Um, but as far as, uh, you know, uh, volunteers or our trainees, um, you know, we're certainly exposing new people to farms. Uh, I think about some of our trainee population. Um, one individual was a truck driver who moved up here because he was losing his eyesight and, and uh, had never, I don't know if he'd ever been on a farm. Um, and we, you know, had him out gleaning and handling produce and he, um, you know, ended up um, being employed at a, at a cafe. Um, you know, we've had, uh, you know, single moms and individuals post incarceration, um, who I'm, I, I assume never thought that that their life path would take them through farming. Um, so, but you know, some of some of my favorite moments really are seeing people start to question um, things they don't always think about. You know. Uh, we don't think about how the food gets to our plates. Um, and so whether that's a trainee and, or, or when we worked with the inmate population or um, you know, being in, in the field with volunteers um, to ask questions about like, why is this food sitting here? Why is this not going somewhere? And, and, and having a realization also that it's not, it's not because of the farmer. Um, that, that there's these other forces that is keeping that food there. Um, I think there's a really beautiful thing in, in volunteering in this work. And I think some of this work has to rely on volunteers, but not all of it. Um, you know, I've seen people from very different walks of life um, meet in the field, um, you know, with dirty knees uh, from picking produce and having conversations that they never would have had otherwise. They never would have had a conversation. Um, I think of a woman who joined us before church and we had a youngster with us who needed to do service through restorative justice. And like that, that morning stands out for me as one of the most powerful of seeing those two work together. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure about city folk, um, <laughs> but, but a, lot of a lot of different people have, have been engaged in our work. That's great. Thank you. Any other questions for Teresa? I was curious about the like training portion of it, where you're um, you're talking about people cleaning the produce um, and repurposing it. Can you speak a little more like how does that program work? Like how does it source food? Is it temporary? How do you get um, you know individuals to become part of that program? Just like to learn a little bit more if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, not at all. Thanks for the question. Um, well, I should just preface by saying that right now we're not operating that program, um, but our hope is is to uh, reinstate some some form or iteration of it, um, and likely in service to the Northeast Kingdom, unless a, a partner brings us in to consult in creating something like this in another area of the state. Um, the training program was um, 16 weeks in length. Um, it, we tried to enroll up to eight people. So it was a cohort model. They'd start at the same time and end at the same time. And they'd go through this progression of training where we'd stack experiences and skills and certifications and the documentaries in the, far, in the field trips, you know, try to build their awareness and skill sets um, in a thoughtful way. Um, the individuals um, all faced some sort of barrier to employment, real or perceived, um, and they committed to work with us um, for uh, five days a week from nine to three each day, 
And we designed our programs so that they would be compensated. We wanted the experience to feel as much like work as it possibly could so that when they transitioned to employment, they could be successful both then earning a wage and meeting the expectation of you know, a nine to five or an eight hour a, a day job. Um, we would recruit individuals for this program through um, a lot of different social service partners. Um, it was based in Winooski, so we had a huge array of resources available to us through the greater Burlington area. Um, but the Department of Labor would refer individuals to the program, uh, probation and parole, um, the housing authority, the community justice center, um, the community action agency, um, different safe houses. Um, I mean, the list was quite long from um, Vogue Rehab and Vabar. Um, and, you know, we would go through an application process and an interview process with individuals. Um, and um, the, as far as the, the food was concerned, um, well, maybe I'll tell you a little bit about some of the, the barriers. So we um, served individuals with physical, mental, emotional uh, disabilities. Um, individuals that were post-incarceration, um, some of violent crimes. A lot of training programs um, don't allow individuals convicted of violent crimes and we didn't wanna create that barrier for individuals. So we did our best during our um, application process to vet risk. Um, uh, individuals who were recovering some from substance misuse, uh, individuals who had experienced homelessness, um, also uh, single parents, uh, folks who were just looking for a change and not knowing what, what to do next. Um, and uh, some folks that uh, were um, descendants of refugee families uh, and uh, also some transitional age youth. The, um, the produce that we would handle, um, mostly we have we have existing relationships with farms. So we just had to promote this as an opportunity for farms. Um, so it's like building another layer of service that um, you know, there's this gleaning work out there and there's this brokering, this buying of your surplus, then there's large scale aggregation and donation. So um, if they have product that they've washed and packed and culled, um, uh, that they know they don't have a market for, then they can let us know and we can arrange transportation for it. We would pay for that product to be transported to us. And it doesn't have to come to us in any sort of cleaned and packed way. That's what we have a program for. Um, so there are some farms where we would have um, every week or maybe every three weeks, we had this pickup arrangement where we knew that they'd have at least one pallet worth of product for us. Um, and this is this is where we started to engage some of the some other for-profit businesses as we paid Black River Produce to haul for us, um, and we had an arrangement with them where we and still do where we pay them a per pallet rate, whether there's 25 pounds on that pallet or 2,000 pounds on that pallet. Um, so what we tried to do is also watch um, and reach out to farmers when we. Uh, we're aware that they might have extra to let them know that this service was available. So we're a member of the Vermont Vegetable Berry Growers Association, and there's a lot of uh, daily listserv chatter, and you'll often see when farmers have, um, they'll post when they have extra uh, stuff. So that answered your questions. Yes, all of them, thank you. Any other questions from the audience so to, to Teresa before we wrap up? Um, we've got maybe 10 more minutes at most. I'll ask another one if you have time and no one else has anything else. Um, I guess along those lines, like, do you see any avenues to expand or kind of like what's your, what's your goals beyond that? I could see you taking a program like that um, 
you know, potentially expanding it and, you know, kind of taking some of those prepped foods, selling them to restaurants or organizations like that to kind of feed in and, and grow out the program. Do you have any, you know, short-term or medium-term goals or anything you're looking to do in that time frame? Yeah. Um, yes, but uh, we have really tr tried to and aspire to um, build these approaches through collaboration, so that it, it so that it isn't fully Salvation Farms that's um, responsible for doing all of this stuff, and that it's that it is more held by more food system players. Um, and also that it's regional. So um, I, we are looking to the four Northeast counties of Vermont to see um, how well can we create a coordinated effort through collaborative partnerships um, to scale um, some minimal processing uh, possibly anchor a job training program with large scale cleaning and packing um, to, to have the, that model rooted somewhere through committed partners where we would have a role, but it wouldn't be our full ownership. Um, and what we want to do is, is, is with that model um, is then be able to look at other regions of Vermont and other potential collaborators to help them get, get similar work up and off the ground. So, um, and that's hard to do. I, I underestimated how, how hard that would be. If we just wanted to do it by ourselves, we probably could be much further along um, than we are uh, in helping this happen for Vermont. Um, I, you know, my perspective is it, ha it has to be something that's in integrated um, in order for it to be lo a stable long term, meaning that, that there ha it has to have you know, cross sector and community commitment. Um, and it can't just be a nonprofit that's constantly fundraising to do this work. Um, Makes sense. Okay, Thanks. good. <laughs> Sometimes I don't know if, if it only I see it or if other people. Um, no, I, that's definitely like a whole, you could basically, your whole business could focus on building that where it makes more sense to, you know, be the facilitator for it, have communities take ownership and scale it. So I, I agree with that approach. <laughs> Any other questions for Teresa? Mm -hmm can't see a lot of faces so I'm assuming that there's audio somewhere out there <laughs> that's great um thank you so much for your time and uh we I've, I've certainly learned a lot I could I have a gazillion other questions but <laughs> for another time <laughs> this is fascinating uh work and it's essential work and Considering where we're heading as a planet, I think uh, uh, it's it's critical to our well-being um, to to remain as local as possible and to not be wasteful. And so I think you're doing very important work, and I congratulate you for it, and I thank you for it. So, anyways, <laughs> and thank you for sharing your time with us. Well, th thank you for having me, and I and I appreciate you closing out that way because um, you know this re this really is about thinking of the time that we're in, and uh, how can we be more responsible, particularly when we think of climate change and the vulnerability of systems, which we've seen in this last year. So, um, thank you for your time. And I would say, if you want to learn more about Salvation Farms, you can visit our website salvationfarms.org. We do have a Facebook page. We also have an Instagram account um, and we do have a blog. So, um, and you all are welcome to sign up to volunteer, become donors. We'll keep you informed as to um, all that we're up to. Thanks so much. <laughs> have a good night. Yay. <laughs> Wonderful.
<laughs> Wonderful. All right. So I don't I think Jack had to divert himself to another program so people can just leave the meeting. And uh, um, I hope you have a good rest of your evening.